Now, every so often we hear about another big bank making another record profit, which doesn't always go down so well with customers paying large sums of interest and fees to those banks, particularly in a challenging economic environment. If that sounds familiar to you, perhaps you've thought about moving your finances to a customer-owned bank. To tell us more about these banks, I'm pleased to say we're joined by Stephanie Elliott from the Customer-Owned Banking Association. Stephanie, welcome to the Savings Tip Jar. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thanks for joining us, Steph. Uh, the first question I'll ask you is, what exactly is a customer-owned bank? Um, how do they function and what makes them different to a bank that has shareholders? Yeah, look, it's a, it's a great question. It's one that we get quite a lot uh, too. So essentially, there are two types of banks in Australia. There are shareholder-owned banks and there are customer-owned banks. Now, a shareholder-owned bank needs to provide dividends uh, and returns to its shareholders, which can create a conflict between what's good for the bank's owners, being its shareholders, and what's good for a bank's customers. A customer-owned bank is different to this because it doesn't have this conflict and this is because the customers and the owners in a customer-owned bank are one and the same. So that's a fundamental difference there because it means that these banks exist only to serve their customers. And that means that all of the profits that the bank makes are reinvested uh, back in to do good for the customers and the community. And this does mean that it can provide uh, competitive products as well. Um, so it, it is a surprise to many people and it's great for many people to know that there are more than four uh, banks out there. In fact, there are 59 customer-owned banks operating in Australia and more than 5 million Australians have already made uh, the choice to bank with a customer-owned bank. Steph, when, when I look through the list of customer-owned banks that are out there, I see there's a lot of them from you know country towns. Um, can you explain the importance of these uh, customer-owned banks to the regions, uh, particularly as well um, the importance during these natural disasters as we saw with, for example, in, in the Lismore floods recently? Look, you're right. Um, while many customer-owned banks uh, do uh, serve cities and metropolitan regions, uh, customer-owned banking as a sector has a very special relationship with regional Australia. And uh, interestingly, we commissioned some research last year, which surprised even us that more than half of the staff of this sector uh, live and work outside Australian cities and a part of the regions. And this includes banks like Regional Australia Bank, uh, Queensland Country Bank up north, the Illawarra Credit Union in New South Wales and Bank of Us uh, down in Tasmania. Um, so it means because these banks uh, live and work in these communities, it means they have a unique understanding of what, what they're looking for. And it also means that they can, they can play a pivotal role uh, during times of crisis too. So to give you an example of that, we have a bank uh, called Summerland uh, Credit Union, which is based in Lismore, New South Wales. And many people would know Lismore because Last year, early last year, it suffered devastating uh, flooding and those communities are, are still recovering today. So you can just imagine the level of disruption that the bank faced when its customers are affected, its employees are in affected. Um, and unfortunately, this bank also lost its head office and its flagship uh, branch. But instead of turning inwards and worrying about itself, instead it focused on what it could do to the community. And it did something really special and something which we think is unprecedented in, in banking. So what it did is it partnered with the local university, the Southern Cross University, to open a banking hub. And five other customer-owned banks came in days after we, we were working hard with them to develop the signage. It was all happening through the night, no weekends. Uh, and they opened their doors to that affected people, many of whom didn't have many belongings uh, or necessarily could walk in and access uh, banking services. They also provided a range of support measures uh, to affected customers. And they did something which is another unique feature of customer and banking. They called uh, every customer who was uh, flood impacted to offer them support and also with the community to, to make donations too. So you don't hear about that every day uh, in banking, but you do hear about it in customer and banking. For sure. And Steph, that's a topic that's close to my heart too, because I used to live in Lismore. Um, I, oh, right. I wasn't there during the floods, uh, but it's a, it's a, it's a topic close to my heart. I still have people and, um, old footy, uh, teammates that I, that I know that were affected that lost their homes and, um, to see the, the customer owned banks sort of rallied around, uh, the community. And so they, they do anything, not just from sponsoring the local, you know, footy club, um, but they also, um, reach out in times of crisis as well, which is, um, it's a, it's a thing of note, 
um, as as you mentioned. So, sort of feeding into that, I want to um, uh, sort of pick your brain about what are the misconceptions people have about customer-owned banks, and what are some myths that you'd like to bust? Yes, look, um, great question. There's three myths that I'd love to bust. Uh, that customer-owned banks are for older people, that your money is safer with a major bank, and that customer-owned banks aren't as innovative. Uh, so in terms of the first one, the customer-owned banks are for older people. I think the genesis of this uh, often exists in the language of credit union or building society, which is something that a lot of people associate with older generations. You know, my grandmother has an account with the credit union or building society. Um, I think many, many customer-owned banks are actually rebranding as banks, but regardless of what they're called, they're essentially a bank. Um, but the difference is that the, the customer owned model, um, but customer owned banks actually really well suited to younger generations. And we commissioned some research last year that found that 86% of Australians who are uh, between 18 and 34 think it's important to have a bank that has a purpose beyond increasing profits for shareholders. Uh, and so two examples are Beyond Bank, which invests 9% of its net profit into community partnerships and Bank Australia, which is to net zero by 2035. Um, now, the second myth that your money is safer with a major bank, um, look, customer-owned banks are secure places to hold your money. They're backed by the Australian government's $250,000 guarantee on deposits in the same way that major banks' deposits are, and they're held to very high standards and closely regulated in the same way as major banks. And then the final myth I'd like to bust is that customer-owned banks aren't as innovative. And what's really interesting here is that despite their size, or perhaps because of their size, customer-owned banks have been at the forefront of banking innovation at a, in Australia. Um, so they were the first to market with ATMs. They were the first to market with uh, App Android and Apple Pay and the first to market with the new payments platform, which as many people know, uh, allows you to um, transmit payments rapidly. Um, and an advantage of being smaller is agility. Um, so to give you an example, Bank Australia gives a clean energy uh, home loans to fund environmental object upgrades and new home purchases and bills. Um, and Police Bank has a new shared equity home loan to support housing affordability for essential workers. Have I have I busted the myth? I reckon we I'd have. Say so, Steph. It's, yeah. it, it's just that that first point too is really um, really important because you're right. Like a lot of language is. Uh, quite ancient, ancient sounding, and um, a lot of people. I think there was a bit of research or a bit of talk last year that found um, a lot of people don't actually know what a credit union is. So by changing the terminology mm -hmm. a bit, um, building they're, they're society still, as well. Yeah, building society. They they sound so ancient, you know. So um, I guess that's why you know we had someone like a Credit Union Australia renamed to Great Southern Bank because um, yeah, it it just gets the the message across that they're a bank and that they're safe to bank with. So that, that's a really good point there. Stephanie, I just wanted to ask something about um, something that we've been seeing a, a bit of recently. Is just it seems like a lot of these customer-owned banks are merging. Uh, we saw Newcastle Permanent and Greater Bank uh, down the Hunter region merging together, and uh, as well as Heritage Bank and uh, People's Choice Credit Union. Um, can you explain a little bit about around why some of these customer-owned banks are merging and and what the, what it means for for customers? Look, you're right. Um, merging are, are, mergers are a feature of the banking industry and actually not just mutual banking. Um, as you've noticed, uh, another high-profile merger on the cards at the moment. Um, and mergers can be beneficial where they give the bank the opportunity to provide services to a broader audience than would otherwise be the case um, when you can leverage uh uh, innovations the other bank is, excels at and where it gives you the scale to compete um, with larger entities. And most recently, we have seen some larger mergers uh, in our sector. And we think this is exciting because it gives customers the opportunity to bank with a bank that operate you know, in, in multiple states and territories. Um, so examples include the recent merger of Newcastle Permanent and Greater Bank, uh, and separately, the merger of Heritage and People's Choice, and in recent years, PNN uh, and BCU. But what's really critical about mergers is that as these banks grow, they keep their customer centricity, and this is absolutely the case in customer-owned banking. So, if people are looking for a large bank that's still customer-owned, there are plenty of good options out there. For sure, and I think that was a good point too. That it's not just the customer-owned sector that's um, that's experiencing this as well. You know. Um, as ANZ that's mulling over a merger with uh, Suncorp. And then, you know, we've, we saw, uh, I think last year, 
um, NAB bought the NeoBank 86400. So um, it, it's, it'll be interesting to see whether those kind of go to serve their customers the same way that the customer owned sector does. Um, and kind of branching off that as well, um, Steph, the, like some of the lowest home loan rates that we've seen now recently, especially in this kind of high interest rate environment, uh, some of the lowest rates are offered by customer owned banks. Can you kind of explain that and, and how, how do, how do these banks do this? Look, you're right. Some um, customer owned banks are very uh, competitive when it comes to home loan rates. And this is in large part to, due to the customer owned model. So I explained at the beginning that there's no conflict in that model because uh, your customer and your owner are one of the same. So when the RBA moves the cash rate and a customer owned bank is thinking about how this would influence its own pricing, it's it's asking the question in a very different way. It's not just saying what's good for the bank, what's good for the bank's shareholders. It's saying, okay, what is the impact on the bank's customers and what is the impact on the bank? And that can lead um, to very competitive pricing decisions. So if people are looking for a home loan or are looking uh, to refinance, you know, I mentioned before, 5 million Australians have made that choice. So there are a lot of options out there and a lot of great great rates on the market. And Steph, uh, another thing we often come across is a lot of customer-owned banks um, seem to have kind of funny names that are somewhat associated with a profession. You know, for example, we've got Teachers Mutual Bank or Police Bank or Defence Bank. Um, can you just tell us a little bit more about these, you know, how they came about to have these names and, and whether you actually have to be a member of that profession to to bank with these these institutions? Yes, uh, look, you're right. Um, often in customer-owned banking, we refer to ourselves as the original peer-to-peer -peer lenders, teachers <laughs> lending to teachers, lending to, to police. That's really the origins of a lot of banks in our sector is the identification of a need in a certain community and a desire to, to feel that need and support others in your community or others in your profession. Um, so there are some great options out there for members of certain professions. And we refer to these banks as bonded banks. And that's because they've got a special relationship with the professions they serve. Um, so many are related to frontline or caring professions. You know, I've mentioned some of these, but there's uni, uni bank, firefighters credit union, police bank and police credit union. But also there's some really large uh, bonded banks as well, such as Defence Bank and Australian Military Bank. Um, and these banks can offer, better, can offer better deals to members of certain professions. So it is worth um, checking them out. And as an example, Teachers Mutual Bank offers a discount of 0.05% for selected home loan products. Um, one final thing I'll just flag on that is that these banks do tend to work quite hard to support the community. So we've spoke before about the profits of a customer-owned bank going back into the bank or the community. Um, so to give you an example of that, Defence Bank has an initiative that it supports called Defence Community Dogs. And what happens is they support uh, the training of dogs to support soldiers who are suffering from PH, um, um, PTSD. So it's a really nice example of the profession uh, through the use of banking services supporting others at need within that same profession. Sure. And I'll just ask a quick one before I kind of jump into the next topic. Um, do you need to pay to be a member of a customer-owned bank? Well, as soon as you open an account, you are a member of a customer-owned bank. Uh, so it's it's very easy to be uh, a member. It simply involves um, doing business with the bank and you become a part owner. Simple as that. Um, and let's talk about some a kind of hot topic at the moment, um, especially in the regions. So uh, a lot of the major banks or shareholders um, have made waves because they've closed a lot of branches and even ATMs. Um, can you explain sort of the customer and banking uh, purpose in the regions and um, and keeping a, a physical branch open despite um, a lot of products going online now? Yeah, um, look, you're right. It is very topical at the moment and there certainly are pressures uh, impacting branch networks across Australia. And this includes, of course, um, customer preferences. So increasingly customers are looking for a really strong digital proposition. Um, and this requires investment uh, to make sure that your digital channels are meeting that demand. And in addition, the cost of getting cash in and out of regional communities. So if someone walks into a bank in Brisbane at 3.30 in the afternoon and deposits uh, a large amount of cash, uh, you can call your cash and transit service and get that picked up. Now you imagine someone walking into a remote community and, and you need to fly that money in and out under security, or if you're on an island, get that money in and out 
with a boat that has security, the costs are incredible. So it is, you know, there are very real pressures. And this does mean that at times banks, including customer owned banks, will need to close branches with a view to maintaining sustainability of the bank for the broader customer base. But the key point here is that these decisions are not taken lightly. They are subject to very careful deliberation. And I think that's reflected in the data that we have uh, for the last financial year, which is that across the sector, there were more than 7% of branches closed. In customer-owned banking, uh, only 1.7% closed. Um, but another part of this story, which is really interesting to tell, is innovative things banks are doing to try and keep these branches open. So we've got the Capricornian up in Queensland, which is co-located with local councils. We've got Heritage and People's Choice, which offers, offers seven community branches. This is a joint venture with the local community um, to retain the banking services in the area. And then traditional credit union, an Indigenous-owned credit union up in the Northern Territory, um, which has money business hubs in partnership with local Indigenous organisations. So yes, there are pressures, um, but there are also some really good news stories and also branches opening in places like Berry uh, and, and Holbrook. Stephanie, we've really covered a lot of ground today. I think you've definitely given our listeners uh, a great idea of uh, customer-owned banks. So really appreciate your insights and uh, thanks so much for joining us on the Saving Tip Jar podcast. Thanks so much for having us.